Hopefully we finish off this section on dehydration, and it won't be too hard because a lot of the same things that we've talked about on the heat stress side of things apply here. Uh, remember what we mean by dehydration, more specifically hypertonic hypovolemia, and what that means. Concentrating body fluids and then less body fluid available because we lose fluid and ions in the sweat. <clears throat> we looked at what average sweat typically was for athletes, just over a liter per hour during exercise and 800 milligrams per liter. All told, a typical athlete loses about one gram of sodium per hour of exercise. So, in this section, we're going to look at what physiological consequences there are of losing that fluid and that sodium. And then we'll touch in the second half on um, how you might assess that personally and what sports drinks do to uh, target those deficits specifically. Replace sodium, replace fluid, give you some carbs for exercise or for energy. So the physiology of dehydration boils down to almost one thing, that the increase in core temperature is exacerbated during exercise. We see this exaggerated rise when dehydrated versus when well hydrated, and it's a progressive incremental impairment in our ability to thermoregulate. So when I say dehydration, I almost always will refer to some percent body mass loss. That's what the BM stands for. And that's how we quantify dehydration. 1% body mass loss, 2% body mass loss. If you're not dehydrated, 0% body mass loss. And in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this field for performance, for exercise, the threshold or the cutoff is typically thought of as 2% body mass loss. Anything above a 2% body mass loss is um, considered to affect performance. Obviously, the higher the decrement, the more you lose, the more dehydrated you are. Perhaps the worse the outcomes are. 2% is the threshold. 1% not typically anything to worry about. 2% and higher is. So a lot of the work that we're going to look at today is presented somewhat like this. This is a graded response to uh, progressive dehydration. And this is only achieved by drinking um, less and less fluid during exercise. And you might be wondering, how does this differ from the heat stress data that we saw in the previous section? Because this is trained cyclists exercising in the heat, and we already saw that the ability to thermoregulate was compromised, that, that body heat was, uh, was gained or stored. There's an acceleration of carbohydrate breakdown and all those good things you talked about in your concept map. Wouldn't those just happen in the heat anyways? I think it's important to notice that in that last section, what we're talking about was this bottom group. This is the response to heat stress alone, or as best as we can approximate in the study. And now, because everyone's um, exposed to the same heat stress while adding varying degrees of dehydration, the spread or the difference between these groups is what we're looking at now. An exaggeration, a compromise in function due to dehydration because all groups uh, exercise in the heat. So dehydration makes it harder to stay cool during exercise. That was the, uh, the single summative point that I put up last, uh, last class, and we see that here. Why? Why does it make it harder to thermoregulate or stay cool during exercise? It all boils down to the fact that we lose blood volume. Specifically, we lose plasma volume because that's the source, the direct source of sweat during exercise. It doesn't mean that plasma or blood volumes are the only ones that are affected, because as we saw last class, there's redistribution of fluid from inside the cells to account for this, but blood volume is central 
to this hypertonic hypovolemia and the inability to stay cool during exercise. So for the next few slides, rather than having four groups with a graded response, we're essentially looking at the two extremes. Um, either well hydrated, which might be zero to 1% to body mass loss, and then very dehydrated, 5% body mass loss, well above the threshold for where we would expect performance decreases. And what I want you to look at is really this last half of the graph, the last half of the table, where the separation starts to um, be apparent. There is some decrease in plasma volume right away at five minutes, which is kind of interesting. Keep that in mind. At 30 minutes, still pretty similar. Only at an hour and onwards do we start to see some separation between the groups where the decline in plasma volume is larger when dehydrated. 10% is lost versus 6% in the well hydrated group. And that only tends to, to get worse as exercise progresses. 13 versus 6% at the end of two hours. So progressive incremental loss in plasma volume which compromises blood flow. This is at the, uh, the center of our understanding for how it impairs the ability to stay cool. <clears throat> I also bring up, there's a, there's a lot of other information in this table, but I also bring up the sodium concentration here. This will come into play later. This is sodium concentration in the blood. And we want to maintain a relatively stable, normal level. If this ever gets too low, it results in a phenomenon that you might have heard of called hyponatremia. We can talk about that a little bit later. But this is a normal level, 144 millimolar. Math off the top of my head is a bit rusty to change that to milligrams. It would be that times 23. <coughs> but the typical sweat might be 40 to 50 millimolar, maybe a third of what we see in the blood. Just to give you some context. So similar in all groups, and we start to see separation again where the blood gets more concentrated when you're dehydrated. Hypertonic hypovolemia. So this comes into play a little bit later. It's a signal that, that causes some of the downstream effects that we'll look at. So note the sodium. Note there's a drop at five minutes. We'll, we'll come back and touch on that later near the end. And then the separation as time goes on. What does this do in terms of thermoregulation? Creates tension. Muscle sets the demand for blood flow, just like we saw in the heat stress section. Now, with this added heat stress, just of exercise or of exercising in the heat, we must also perfuse the skin, which allows us to lose heat to the environment. But because blood volume is compromised, not only is there tension from the fact that we have to send blood to two places, now we have to send less blood to two places. There's less blood available to go to the skin and the muscle. So this is an exaggeration of that tension that we have already seen on the, uh, the heat stress side of things. And so it's probably not a surprise that all the usual suspects are apparent here. With a compromised uh, plasma volume, less blood to circulate to all those areas, cardiac output falls. Over two hours, as you progressively dehydrate, we see this linear decrease in cardiac output. Interestingly, in this group, cardiac output wasn't compromised when you stayed well hydrated. That's kind of remarkable. There wasn't even a small drop off, but pretty large separation, especially at 120 minutes, at two hours. So cardiac output is compromised again because increasing heart rate cannot compensate for the falling stroke volume or the inadequate venous return. 60 minutes to two hours, 
we start to see an acceleration of heart rate in the dehydrated group, 20 beats per minute higher at the end of exercise to compensate for this 40 milliliter smaller stroke volume. But even with this compensation, we see this progressive linear decline in cardiac output. There's not enough blood to circulate to the skin and the muscle and return back to the heart. Venous return is compromised. So in the face of this, this is a pretty significant stress. How does the body try to continue exercising in this situation? You do everything you can to keep doing the work. And this is born out of um, work physiology. When exercise was something you had to do to survive or succeed, your body wants to continue operating. We didn't know when we were putting our genetics together, we were trying for personal best or to, to race against the competition. We try to accommodate this uh, compromised cardiac output. So what do we do? We try to decrease blood flow to the skin, which you can imagine will sabotage all of, uh, or this entire scenario. We try to compromise or reduce blood flow to the skin. We want to make sure the muscle can work. In the face of less blood volume, if we have to pick one or the other, we're going to pick muscle. That's the thing that's allowing us to work, perform, survive. And so forearm blood flow, which is shown here, which we use as a surrogate for blood flow to the entire skin surface. This is just easier to measure. Starts to decrease compared to a well hydrated scenario. At, at two hours, we see half of the blood flow to the skin in a dehydrated state than we do when we're well hydrated. And this is all due to that sodium that I brought up on the first slide. How do we achieve this reduced skin blood flow? We increase the resistance to flow. And all that resistance is, is constriction of the vessels. Right? If you don't want water flowing somewhere, you close the valve. If we don't want blood going to the skin, we close the valves. We constrict the arteries that supply the skin, and that's what we're looking at here in the second inset graph. The increase in vascular resistance is simply how much constriction is there. Well, when you're dehydrated, there's twice as much constriction, meaning there's twice as much resistance, cutting flow in half. This doesn't just happen on its own. Because the blood starts to get saltier and concentrated, there's an area in the hypothalamus that is always monitoring blood concentration. It's bathed in fluid that uh, is similar to uh, blood concentration or blood sodium content. And when the hypothalamus senses that that fluid is getting saltier, it signals the arterioles to constrict. This is actively done by the cardiovascular center in the brain. When the blood starts to get salty, this is the response. It constricts flow to the skin. What you can imagine is probably not a good thing long term. No blood flow to the skin or less blood flow to the skin means less heat lost, more heat stored, and now you can start to understand how that separation of core temperatures manifests. Not only that, we reduce blood flow to the skin and it would then make sense to also reduce sweat rate because if you're not sending heat to be dissipated to the environment, well, why continue to sweat? This has the added benefit of trying to preserve some of the fluid and preserve some of the ions that would otherwise be lost. And what we're looking at here are four different traces 
of various levels of dehydration and the responsiveness of sweating. When does sweating initiate and how quickly does it initiate? We know that it initiates in response to a certain increase in temperature. We want it to be higher to dissipate that heat. But when you're dehydrated, you see this progressive downward shift where you sweat less and generally you don't sweat as much as core temperature goes up. This is um, the manifestation of, of the, uh, the heat stroke and uh, heat exhaustion rules where if you see someone that's obviously dizzy, falling over, really hot, and their skin's clammy and they're not sweating, that's an indication of them being uh, too dehydrated. They stop to sweat or, or they reduce their sweating significantly and it doesn't increase as readily with core temperature. So the response initiates later, the sensitivity is slightly reduced, less sweat uh, means less heat loss, less blood flow to the skin means less heat available for heat loss, less blood in total means less venous return, cardiac output drops, core temperature increases, and core temperature increasing is really the crux of what we consider the consequences of dehydration at least in my opinion. The, uh, the progressive loss of fluid in and of itself seems to not be too significant in terms of um, reducing performance, but it's the heat generated in this new situation that uh, results in these pretty bad consequences. So what are the things that happen once you're dehydrated in the heat? Again, it's probably no surprise to see similar consequences here as in the heat stress section. One of those main consequences was an accelerated use of carbohydrate, using glycogen stored in the muscle. The first evidence for this came from this relatively underpowered study from a fellow named Mark Hargraves in, uh, in Australia. Really good exercise physiologists like him a lot, but only five trained cyclists. There's no heat stress here, so we're isolating the effects of uh, fluid replacement, either complete fluid replacement or not drinking anything in a moderate environment. So we're trying to isolate the effect of dehydration per se and not the heat. And overall, all this figure tells us is if you don't stay hydrated, glycogen use goes up. If you're 2% dehydrated, you use more glycogen, which we know is a sign of fatigue or will result eventually in fatigue. Let's put it that way. So in five trained cyclists, this first attempt saw that, yeah, okay, if you're dehydrated, glycogen use is higher. But there's also this confounding factor of core temperature being elevated in that group as well even though we're trying to have them exercise in a normal environment, we can't help the fact that sweating shuts down, blood flow to the skin shuts down, and we start to increase core temperature more when dehydrated versus well hydrated. So there's a little bit of a separation. Is this result due to dehydration itself, or is it due to a higher temperature? We can't answer that with this study. We can answer that with one study that we've already seen, two-thirds of which we've already seen. I brought this up in the heat stress section to show you enhanced glycogen use, and we've only focused on the last two bars. This was the study where um, the participants were completely dehydrated, 4% body mass loss, round it to 5. They rehydrated so they weren't... Um, dehydrated during this test, and these bars show the results of the test. When they were well hydrated, they exercised either in a normal environment or the heat, and we saw, okay, in the heat, carbohydrate use went up, or glycogen use went up. That's no surprise. What we're adding here 
is uh, one group that instead of correcting this scenario, stayed dehydrated and then exercised um, in a normal environment. We're trying to separate the effect of the heat from the effect of being dehydrated. And what we're looking at in this graph is that while fluid replacement reduced glycogen use, so fluid replacement reduced glycogen use during exercise in a neutral environment, it lost that ability when exercise was completed in the heat. While it was able to reduce glycogen use in a neutral environment, it lost that ability when exercise was conducted in the heat. This effectively says whether you are dehydrated or whether you exercise in the heat, glycogen use is accelerated in both cases. That these two extreme bars are at the same level indicates accelerated glycogen use both due to dehydration and due to um, hypothermia. So each independently will increase glycogen use. What I didn't put on here, which I think is pretty important, is um, where we saw differences in core temperature in the Hargrave study on the last slide. No difference in temperature here. It's not a variable. It's only the fact that these individuals are dehydrated and the individuals on the right are exercising in the heat. There's no um, measurable difference in core temperature. <clears throat> Now, for the average athlete, we don't care so much about this. We care about what effect this has. No one really measures glycogen use. We don't measure carbohydrate uh, breakdown. We're more concerned about performance. Does that impact our ability to perform? In all cases, for running, it does. A comparison of hydrated and dehydrated athletes, you can see the percent body mass loss at the bottom. In some cases, it's not even what we would call significant, or it's not yet reached that 2% threshold. But there's a slowing of pace in 1500 meter, 5000 meter, and 10K race pace. 5 to 7% decrease in performance across the board when dehydrated. So whether you care about glycogen use, the effect is born at a whole body performance level at all relative intensities. I should also point out, these, um, there's not a lot of time in a 1500 meter race to sweat a lot and become dehydrated. So you might be thinking, what's going on with this, this uh, data? This dehydration was caused by diuretics. So they administered diuretics beforehand to help excrete some extra fluid to just measure the effect of what does that fluid deficit uh, mean in terms of performance. So it's a bit different than naturally sweating, but the, uh, the message is still the same. So running performance is decreased. We see this in cycling also. What about other non-traditional types of exercise? What about people that don't just want to exercise at a moderate intensity? What about skills performance? And this is specific to basketball. This was a really interesting study looking at a series of time drills, so like shuttle running, uh, slalom dribble type tasks, and then uh, free throws, three-point shots, these are all the time drills on the left and all the shooting drills on the right. The combined effects of either being 1, 2, 3, or 4% dehydrated. Lindsay Baker is now um, a scientist at the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Does a lot of work with um, sweat loss, measurement, things like that. Typical Gatorade type science. And this was one of her doctoral um, projects trying to mimic basketball and then looking to see if there was an effect of being dehydrated on basketball performance. 
And what you're seeing here is a progressive uh, loss or an eroding of performance. The time drills took longer and the shooting drills got poorer. They, they went down. All relative to a well hydrated control. So the, uh, the x-axis here is the time when hydrated properly or the number of shots made when hydrated properly. And then what we're looking at in these boxes is the change from that well hydrated sorry, well hydrated condition. Slower time drills, fewer shots made, a progressive decrease in performance, skills performance, when dehydrated. So whatever the, uh, the reason, the uh, overall effect is slower performance or reduced running performance, poor skills performance, but also compromised mental performance. And this is where a lot of the dehydration uh, related work is, is heading in something that I found when I was doing my doctoral research. The, uh, the muscle can still work pretty well. You certainly have a reduced ability to stay cool, but the main consequence of being dehydrated is in being able to turn the muscle on, motivate yourself to exercise, um, motivate yourself to run faster, and coordination, or reaction time. So culminating in fewer shots made, uh, we saw a decreased accuracy of passing in ice hockey and shooting drills in ice hockey. This is pure cognition. So these are uh, two different tests that are meant to evaluate different areas of cognition. When we say cognition, we we don't really know what we mean. It's a very broad area. It's an umbrella term meant to say, how are you thinking? Are you thinking clearly? What kinds of elements of thinking are compromised? So serial addition is a test where you're given numbers and you have to add up the previous two plus the new number. And then you're given a, a, a next number. You have to figure out the previous two plus the next number. Keeping a running total in your head and comparing that to an actual answer. Uh, word recognition is you're given a list of words to memorize initially and then you are asked to recall whether or not this candidate word is on the list or not. So numbers versus words, it's, it's a different kind of memory or a different kind of cognition and they all go down when dehydrated. Not in the heat but just because of a fluid deficit. In some cases you're giving half of the correct responses at a 4% body mass loss. So this is the, this is the kind of work that I think um, um, will really benefit from more research on, the, on dehydration. Something like this, you can really, you can easily see how it would impact like team performance, skills performance, trying to execute a pass in ice hockey, identifying the colors of uh, your, your teammates' jerseys, trying to avoid a check, something like that. Um, the types of tests that we use, that I use for uh, evaluating cognition are something like the Stroop test, which you might have seen before. Stroop test is a really well, uh, really well validated cognitive test that evaluates executive function, your ability to process and eliminate distractions, and also reaction time. So, in this type of test, you're given a word, and it's the name of a color, and the letters are written in a different color. So here the word orange is written in red letters. Now I, as the subject, have to go into this list and find the word red to match the color of the letters, and the word red is written in yellow letters. So a, a bunch of conflicting inputs that, if you're not focused, can derail you. If you answer wrong three times, the test is over. Here I'm collecting a composite score, so how quickly you react, how many right answers you give. And this was all done with a smartphone, so you can um, just touch the screen where, uh, uh, where the correct answer is. Now, cognition measured this way or measured with a word memory test is, is fantastic. Measured with shooting accuracy is one thing, but there are other real-world consequences of a reduced cognitive function, especially when dehydrated, that I personally experienced a couple years ago. So I'm sharing this. This was um, 
I used to cycle a, a lot. This was a, a really long ride up to the, uh, the Strait, all the way down almost to New Glasgow, and then back along the old number four. Four hour time. I went with Dave Risk, who's over in engineering, and, and he is he's a beast on the bicycle. He's a, he's a quick guy. So pretty dehydrated. 3% dehydrated by the end of this ride. And coming back through town, of all things, taking a little break, coming down the hill over the bridge by the wheel. And you might have noticed that the, uh, the, the road, the asphalt's not really in the best condition, especially nowadays with the plows. It's been that way forever, for the past couple years. So I hit um, a really nice little pothole that was hidden by some, some shade from the trees. Just wiped out completely, face planted right in front of the wheel. This is some of the, uh, the consequences. You can see the gash in my hands, the helmet, which probably saved my life or, or, or prevented some pretty serious injury that day. A couple other bruises and abrasions. Probably due to the fact that at this point, Tired, exhausted, hot, dehydrated, not thinking properly, uncoordinated, not watching for potholes, hit a little divot, and then this was the result. So the performance consequences that we t as we talk about them can be a fair bit more serious and severe than simply not making enough shots. <clears throat> so what do we do? How do I avoid falling off my bike besides getting better balance and, and paying attention? How do we hydrate successfully to preserve blood flow to the skin, to maintain sweat rate, to minimize the increase in core temperature? How do we hydrate successfully? In simple terms, you want to drink not as much as possible. But you want to drink enough to stay in what we would call uh, the comfort zone and avoid this zone of impending exhaustion. So if I'm using temperature, rectal temperature, or core temperature, and I'm just plotting in general what happens over time. If I, if I dehydrate, I get this acceleration of core temperature like we saw in the first graph today. And if I'm up in this range, all those negative consequences start to occur. Glycogen use goes up. Shooting skill goes down, balance goes down, cognition goes down. But if I can maintain fluid balance perfectly, in theory, I should be able to stay lower within this comfort zone. I'm still going to observe a rise in core temperature. That's inevitable. But I can deal with it. I can divert blood flow. I can sweat, I can deal with it if I stay in fluid balance. If left to um, our own means, as humans, we will voluntarily decide to approach this zone of impending exhaustion. If we drink fluid uh, ad libitum, which means voluntarily, we only replace maybe two-thirds of the sweat that we lose. We're not really good with our thirst mechanism to say, okay, I really need to start drinking more. I'm becoming dehydrated. We allow ourselves to get dehydrated. We allow temperature to drift up. And so what, uh, what we're trying to accomplish in this section is pushing this uh, voluntary drinking line down. We're hopefully never in this zone of impending exhaustion, but we want to, to, to get everyone down towards this fluid balance line. So how do we drink properly and what do we drink to accomplish this? The answer is not water. And I'll talk about that soon. But drinking water in excessive volumes is what will dilute uh, blood sodium and result in hyponatremia. That's why so many people say, drink to thirst, drink to thirst. Don't force drinking water. Even if you uh, overdrink something like a, like a sports drink, there's not enough sodium in it to uh, prevent eventual hyponatremia. That's an, ex an extreme case. Do you know what the problem is with hyponatremia before we go on? You know it's bad. You've heard about it before, right? Maybe. So it, um, 
It's all based on movement of fluid, trying to equalize concentrations. So at the start, we saw um, sweat being removed and then fluid moved between the, uh, the cells and the rest of the body to, to equalize concentration. Well, what happens when you drink a ton of water is the blood gets really diluted. And we don't want that to, to happen. Fluid moves to equilibrate the concentrations. And the only place it can move is into the cells. Really dilute blood, concentrated cells, fluid moves into the cells to equalize concentration. Now, usually it's not a bad thing. Cells just swell, and you'll pee it out later. It's a bad thing when you don't have room for those cells and their swelling. And the place that you don't have room is in the skull. Your brain takes up 95% of the volume of the skull. And so as fluid rushes into the cells in the brain and it expands, it pushes against the inside of the skull. Just the natural movement of fluid. And if it pushes too much, damage to the brain, and you can die from hyponatremia. So overdrinking, not great. Drinking low sodium fluids, worse than drinking higher sodium fluids, which is why the sports drink was invented. <clears throat> we know uh, Gatorade, Powerade, Kirkland sports drink as sports drink. That's the colloquial term for it. Um, in the, the X-Phys or the, the research field, we call them carbohydrate electrolyte solutions, or CES. We're not content with sports drink. Carbohydrate electrolyte solutions, which describes exactly what they are. A mix of fluid, carbohydrate, and electrolytes. And the um, the idea is, in order to push all of those lines down and reach fluid balance, we need flavor, something that's palatable to help people want to drink. We need fluid to achieve fluid balance. We need sodium, which essentially holds on to fluid in the blood. The problem with drinking water is that fluid can escape the blood, move into the cells, Sodium, by osmosis, holds it in the blood. And then while we're at it, why not add carbohydrate? Carbohydrate adds to the palatability. I don't know anyone that doesn't like sweet things. And it provides fuel to the muscle, to the heart, to the brain, in order to uh, function properly or continue functioning properly. So that's why sports drinks were invented, to improve on the idea of just drinking water. Now, is there a benefit? Gatorade's market cap might indicate that there is a benefit. The entire, um, I think the, the, the revenue they generate in Canada is about as much as Texas in the States alone. Pretty large market cap. Um, is there a benefit of adding these things? Does it work? And what we're looking at here is um, a systematic identification of whether just drinking fluid improves time trial performance and or whether drinking carbohydrate improves time trial performance. So this is trained cyclists in the heat. They do 50 minutes at a pretty high intensity and then a 10 minute time trial. And what we're looking at in these squares is the time it takes to do that 10 minute time trial. So it's meant to be a pretty competitive short term event and then the sprint to the finish at the end. And how long does it take you to sprint to the finish at the end? So if we look at the groups, um, well the groups either had fluid or carbohydrate or both, just the effect of ingesting carbohydrate, either zero grams versus a total of 80 in the course of an hour, 
improved performance by 6%. So you see 10 and a half, 11 and a half minutes on the top two squares, 10, 10 and a half minutes on the bottom. That's six and a half percent improvement in time trial performance just due to carbohydrate alone. So this is combining uh, those two groups. The effect of just drinking fluid. Ethically, we couldn't give them nothing. And I say we like I was involved, but they, the researchers, couldn't give them nothing. So 200 milliliters, the equivalent of a small juice box, versus 1,300 mils, pretty close to that sweat rate, that average sweat rate we saw right at the start. Small fluid replacement versus large fluid replacement. The combined effect was a time trial performance of 11 minutes with little fluid, 10 minutes, 10 and a third minutes with uh, fluid replacement, 7% improvement. So drinking carbohydrate works, drinking fluid or ingesting fluid works, and they are additive. They are independent and additive effects. If I compare just going for a run and having 200 mils of water, it takes me 11 minutes plus to do the time trial in that situation. If instead I have 80 grams of carbohydrate and 1.3 liters of fluid, 12% improvement in performance. Minute and a half faster. Minute and a half for about a 10 minute performance test. Olympic level athletes look for that 2 to 3% edge. This is 12 to 13%. Pretty awesome. That's why you'll never see any Olympic athlete not using fluid and carbohydrate. So fluid works, carbohydrate works. We have some reason to believe sports drinks are beneficial. Why add sodium? Sodium is a little bit trickier because there's been little research on what sodium does during the exercise. And if you think about the situation that we've set up, it might not really have a role during exercise per se. Sodium holds onto fluid, helps maintain blood volume, and allows thermoregulation to continue. Maybe during long duration endurance type exercise. But where sodium really comes into play is in recovery. And this trace shows fluid balance in recovery. We're looking at a graded uh, sodium replacement, either fluid with no sodium, fluid with 600 milligrams, 1,100, or uh, 2,300 milligrams, lots of sodium, almost unpalatable at this higher, higher range. The, uh, the numbers here are millimolar, which is what we like to use in, in uh, the science side of things on the research side. Compare that to 144 millimolar, which was the average concentration of blood. You're almost drinking blood salty water here. So not just looking at the spread of different sodium concentrations, we're looking at how well we can restore fluid balance. So this is a two-hour exercise with dehydration, big loss of body fluid. 1.5 uh, liters lost. And then in recovery, we give one and a half times whatever the fluid loss was of these different salty concentrations and see, okay, over the next six hours, how much do we get rid of? How much do we pee out? Is our attempt to rehydrate successful or not? And it's only successful when you ingest a really salty fluid. So the reason, the rationale for adding sodium is shown here. You retain more fluid in proportion to how much sodium you ingest. If you just ingest water, you do retain some, but you lose half of it. Six hours later, you're back to being dehydrated. 
And this might not be so much of a concern if this is your one exercise bout for the week. You're going to start eating, drinking normally. You'll gradually restore this deficit. It is a concern if you've got uh, another really intense hockey game to play tomorrow or you're in a round-robin tournament of some kind. Maybe you're playing squash and there's a, a lot of bouts to do on the ladder, something like that. This really will impact your performance when you start the next bout in, uh, in close succession. So the retention of fluid is proportional to the amount of sodium ingested. For context, seawater <coughs> is 600 millimolar, so six times this highest concentration. It's not nearly as bad as drinking seawater, which has a whole host of other organisms and things in, in it anyways. But um, salty concentration, salty fluids. Recently, there is some indication sodium will um, benefit the exercise itself. This is real life ultra marathon, a half Ironman race in Hawaii with salt capsules versus placebo capsules. And what we're looking at here is swimming velocity, cycling velocity, running velocity. And there's not a whole lot of difference. Running velocity is a bit faster. Cycling velocity is a bit faster. Swimming doesn't really change. Where we see a big difference is in the overall finishing time. The group that had this baggie full of salt capsules finished half an hour faster than the group that had a baggie full of cornstarch filled capsules. So they don't know what the capsules are. They ingest these during the Ironman. They drink what they would normally drink. They, they run what they would normally run. They're matched for fitness, body composition, pacing, uh, etc. So just adding these salt capsules allowed them to finish faster. We don't really know why, but if you dig into the paper, they do a bunch of tests afterwards. And one of the things that was improved in this uh, salt group that wasn't improved in the control group was the ability to recruit the muscle. Remember on the heat stress side, we looked at voluntary activation it goes down when your core temperature goes up. And you can recover it if your core temperature goes back down. So taking these salt capsules increased voluntary activation. Whether that's the reason for this half an hour improvement in half Ironman performance, I'm not sure. But it's kind of interesting to note that being able to turn the muscle on was improved in the salt group. You might also be wondering, and I, I probably should have added this in on the slide too, you might also be wondering, are they both dehydrated? 300 minutes is a lot of time to exercise. What is that, five hours? It's a lot of time to exercise. They're sweating this whole time. They both are dehydrated, about 3%. The salt group was a little less dehydrated, but it's not significant. So this improvement occurs even with 3% body mass loss. So this is appealing. This is something that we want to look into more because there hasn't been a lot of work on what salt does during exercise. There's reason to believe it might do something, according to studies like this. 